Hey, welcome to High Resolution. My name is Bobby Koshal. And I'm Jared Arandu. We're sitting down with 25 masters of the design industry. If you've been sitting with us every single week for the past few weeks, you've been following us all over the country. We did a little road trip from New York. We're now in Boston. And we're meeting with someone fun today. Who are we meeting with? We're speaking with the founder of UIE and Center Center. That's Jared Spool. He's going to talk about UX design's recent coming of age, the role design plays in a business, and starting yet another design school. Give us a second, stick around, it's going to be worth it, right after this partner message. Thanks to Squarespace for their support. Whether you need a domain, a website, or an online store, make your next move at Squarespace. Visit squarespace.com and enter the code HIGHRESOLUTION, one word, for 10% off your first purchase. Jared, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. What's one thing about design that's clear to you that you don't think is clear to other people? Uh, I think it depends who the other people are, mm -hmm. but uh, I think the, the big thing is, is that people think design is about an end process. It's about you know producing a thing, producing uh, a service. Uh, when design is really about solving problems and it's really about uh, understanding what those problems are and that any solution, any artifact, any uh, production is just an attempt at understanding the problem better. And once you sort of see design as problem solving, it is a uh, a very different ballgame, and you know that's one of those phrases that people use as lip service. You know, we're here to solve problems, but the what they mean is we're here to produce solutions. I think what a lot of people don't see is that it's really about no, we're here to really understand why the problem's a problem, and once we understand why the problem's a problem, any number of solutions will get us to a better place. You think design also does a good job using its process to find problems? Because once you have a problem, I understand diving into why that's a problem, but there's also the problem of not knowing what the problems are. Yeah, so design doesn't understand problems because design is just a notion. Yep. It's, not, it's not a thinking thing. Yep. Uh, uh, people understand problems, and people understand problems best by using design practice, but not all design practices will get you to understanding the problem. Mm. So you need a set of design practices that really help you understand the problem. And so the act of designing for a, a sophisticated designer is really understanding how you're going to get to that place. And so how are you, how are you going to start taking apart the problems um, that that you're you're working towards and really get to a, a solid understanding of of what it is that makes the world a better place you you recently i read your blog and uh, you recently wrote a very interesting article called why I can't convince executives to invest in UX. Now, if you can't convince executives to invest in UX, there's no hope for the rest of us. So I want you to assume for a second that you're sitting, and you've probably done this a thousand times before, but let's try on camera this time. You're sitting across from executives that are willing to listen, and they are objectively paying attention to what you're saying, and they want to invest in UX. How would you convince them to, to just push the needle and hit the button and say, yes, like this is, this is something that, that you must do? Oh, that's easy. What problem are we trying to solve? Um, let's 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 actually call it a. No, that's the question. I mean, that's oh, how that's you do the, it. Oh, I see. <laughs> right? Is you just say what problem are we trying to solve? Right? What is it that we need? You know, the, the question I often use is let's say let's say by some wacky chance this thing you want to do yeah. actually works, yeah. and we make the thing that you want us to make and it's a success in the world, how's the world different, right? What, what is actually the difference in the world because we did this thing? And oftentimes it's like, what? The first reaction is, well, because we'll all be richer. I'm like, okay, that's not, 
that's, that's a difference for you. That's not a difference for everybody. What, what is it that actually makes the world better because we've done this thing? And that's, that's a starting point for for having the conversation is to understand what that end goal is mm. and that turns out to be one of the hardest things for people to get to is is to sort of say okay we're we know we have to produce this thing we're going to produce this new version of our product and it's going to go out and okay great five years later what's different because we did that how has the world changed because we did that and if we can get to that conversation as to how the world has changed, then suddenly we know, okay, is this the tool to get us there or is some other thing the tool to get us there? Once we're done with this, what's the next step after that? And what's the next step after that, right? And now we're on this trajectory to get to that thing five years from now that, that this short-term project is just a, a baby step for. And that that's the that's the key piece is to is to is to get to that vision of what what the experience will be like five years from now. So it's thinking about the outcome before you make any. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's there's an old phrase of of starting with the end in mind, mm -hmm. right? Understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Are we all on the same page? You know, let's say we're going to produce a new watch thing. Okay, so this is a new watch. Why, right? What is it that will change five years after we've produced this watch such that everybody's got them? What are they doing now differently? How is that changing their life? And probably one of the problems that we have with, you know, the Apple Watch is no one can answer that question today, right? What is different about it? You know, if you look at 2007 when the iPhone came out and you look at 2012 when everybody had smartphone type products, suddenly we have this, this vast difference in what the technology can do and what people are doing. And, it, and it's, it's not at all what we thought that iPhone was because remember the first iPhone didn't have apps, mm -hmm. right? The first iPhone uh, couldn't send uh, pictures with text, let alone have be a platform where people are making short films on, you know, uh, uh, didn't have a video capability, didn't, you know, there were lots of things that iPhone couldn't do at that moment. Five years later, it's a bigger deal. Ten years later, it's, you know, an accepted thing in the universe. The, 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 how did we get to that point? What makes that difference? And how is your product or service going to be uh, better? How is it going to, to change the world that way? And what is it going to do? Even if what you're making is something that, you know, just a tool that teachers use in a classroom, how is education going to change because you've produced this tool in the classroom? You're making something for uh, salespeople to sell better. How, how is it that the customer salesperson relationship changes because you've built this thing? And, and, and those are the questions that you want to get to. And so when we're talking about, you know, how do you convince executives to invest in design? What you really want to do is get them to start talking about how are you changing the world? What is it that you're trying to do here? And then back into the fact that the only way they're going to get there is through a well-designed product. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's sort of secondary to the, the thing. The why. The why is the Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious how specific they should be getting in that answer. Like is this, you, you know, you can run the risk of if it's too specific, you kind of back yourself into a corner. And there is a direction that the business will never go because that is, the, that is going to be the... Um, the, the, the box that you have to check every time you make a product decision, right? But if you make it too vague, then you could do anything and might actually lose product vision focus. Specificity doesn't back you into a corner. Um, uh, stubbornness backs into your mm -hmm. corner, right? Not saying, oh, that's better than what we were thinking. Okay. Let's go with that, yeah. right? That's what you use to avoid backing into a corner. Specificity actually helps. If you can describe that experience in detail, people can start to take apart pieces of it. They can start to say, oh, in order to accomplish that piece, I need to build this infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's great. Uh, and, but you know, the way to think about a vision is it's basically a flag in the sand. 
uh, it's a giant flag on a post that's in the sand far away. So far away that we can't get there tomorrow. We can't get there the next week. It's going to take us years to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. But we can see it. It's this nice big flag. It's flapping in the wings. Not only can I see it, but you can see it. And I probably just went thunk on your microphone. Not only can I see it, but you can see it. And um, uh, uh, Jared can see it. Everybody can see it. And the, uh, the beauty of this this flag is, it's in the sand. So if the market changes, if the, if the customers change, if a competitor comes out with something that, that, that shifts the world, right? we can pick it up and we can put it in the sand someplace else. And the thing is, as long as we can each see it, the, the standing orders are march towards the flag. Mm -hmm. And if we pick it up and move it, it's still marched towards the flag. It just means that we have to be able, good at communicating, hey, the flag's moved, it's mm -hmm. now over here, it's not over there but it's still in sight, I'm still marching towards it. And even if we start in different places, we're converging. So when you talk to executives, what you really want to figure out is, where's the flag? What is the flag? Where is it? And how do we make it as visible as possible? And if we can make it as visible as possible, we don't have to worry about it moving. We just have to worry about making sure that everybody's clear Take a baby step towards the flag. Take a baby step towards the flag. Just keep doing that over and over again. Eventually, you hit the flag. If you look at the, the last few years, I mean, it's, it, it's starting to become a little bit clear that companies are going through a sort of a coming of age in the design function anyway. Do, do, you, think that, do you think that businesses need to go through a set of levels for, to, to reach UX maturity? Um, like, How can a business pinpoint where they are in UX maturity? Uh, UX maturity is, uh, UX design maturity is, I think, a better phrase, mm -hmm. um, is a, is something that, that has to do with understanding how the design elements actually play into the success of your products and services, right? So organizations sort of start at this stage that, that we call uh, the dark ages, where they don't even know that there is a design thing, there is a UX thing, and they, all they're about is just getting the product out the door, technically, and making sure that you know it does what the business needs it to do. So there, whatever design emerges is what design you have, right? And, and every product has a design, it's just sometimes it's, not an intentional design. And so no one's thought about the design and it just comes out. And of course, it's probably not usable, it's probably not elegant, but in some cases, people love it, the customers love it, because they, uh, it does something that nothing else does. You know, I can, I can now, you know, the first, the first x-ray machine was a, incredibly hard to use, but it was a great x-ray machine because you could see things under the skin that you couldn't see otherwise, and suddenly you can make diagnoses you couldn't make before. Mm -hmm. so, so this was something that you had to be a trained professional to operate in order to, to, to use it and use it safely, but the, the user experience of it was horrible. Right, and every every product, every service sort of goes through that stage, and companies go through that stage too, where they just you know they're so focused on just existing that they just get it out there, and then uh, within organizations, often what happens is some leader within the organization says, you know, we could do a little better with than this, and they 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 create something with their team that is a better designed thing. Right, and the organization gets excited about this in many cases, and and in some cases we'll try to get them to continue. But an organization that's not set up for design, usually the weight of the rest of the organization pushes back on on that thing, and it dies off. Right, mm -hmm. and so we call that spot UX design, where you know if you if you were to take in a large organization, if you were to take some sort of uh, fMRI like mapping of of this organization you would see good design pop up here and then burn out and good design pop up there and burn out it would just be sort of these little sparks of design that would show up in the organization but then the organization burns it out the next stage 
uh, is when someone says, you know what, this design stuff, this actually makes sense for us. We need to invest in it. So suddenly you have an executive investing in this and they hire a design manager and the design manager builds a design team and that team serves the organization. And so that's what we call design as a service. So that's sort of the next stage. And then design as a service, you go out and you are looking at uh, uh, finding the, the different uh, uh, opportunities that design can improve a product or a service and you go in and you do design things and, and sure enough, you know, if the team is willing, you get them to produce something that's better. Uh, and a lot of organizations think that's, that's the ultimate, right? We're going to build this design team, and once the design team's in place, they'll, they'll have their seat at the table, and they can, they can make design happen everywhere. But that's not the ultimate. There's another point, which is if you do that really well, one team, then two teams, then three teams start to realize that they actually need design more permanently than just going to the service organization and hiring their designers right before the release or right at the beginning or whatever, wherever they tend to insert themselves. And that they need a designer that's going to think about multiple releases at a time. And they need designers that are always on the project to handle any question that comes up and to work side by side with the developers and the product managers and the other people on the team. So now you're in this position where um, design is uh, now a function of uh, being embedded on the team. So we call that embedded UX design and, and they are, they are full-time there. Uh, and some organizations are there and they think, oh, that's the ultimate. But it turns out that, that it's not. What we found is, is that there are teams that go beyond that. And the teams that go beyond that, people who uh, conventionally have not been referred to as designers, product managers, developers, other people on the team, start to make design decisions. Turns out they've always been making design decisions, but now they actually understand the difference between making those design decisions well and making them poorly. And they start to actually make better design decisions. And they actually can handle m most of the small design questions that come up. They could handle without a official designer getting involved. And suddenly you're at what we call infused design. Right, where everybody on the team is infused with understanding what design is. And that's the ultimate stage as far as we know. That's the point where if you had everybody in the organization, you know, including the accounting department and the legal department, if they all understood the difference between good design and bad design and they understood where design plays out, suddenly um, uh, th the decisions they make, you know, when, when compliance says you have to present these disclosures on the screen to make sure our customers are aware of the regulatory constraints that we work under, they can put those up in a way that are, hey, in order for us to do the job for you, here's a little thing you need to know. Are you cool with that? Sure, check the box. Okay, we're ready to get going. Right? Suddenly they can make a good design decision and it's no longer, you must agree to the terms and conditions that we're not going to actually show you. Huh. Right. Yeah. How I'm curious, what is the designer or design team in a company doing to get from the embedded design phase to the infused? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, what they're doing is they are primarily uh, initially they're educating. Mm -hmm. Right. The problem initially is a, is a literacy problem. Most of the time, what prevents organizations from producing good design is they don't, they have key individuals who don't know the difference between good design and poor design. So they're just putting stuff out. And they, they as far as they know, it's as good as anything else. Since they don't know what the difference is, they can't tell that the thing they produced wasn't good. It seems like it is. I mean, what's the difference? And... So then you're in this constant battle of saying, no, that thing you just produced, that was crap. You have to let us, but they can't see the difference. So you sh they put them side by side and they say, I don't yeah, understand, yeah. right? The button so, jumped. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. So, so, so now, so a lot of what design teams do is design literacy. And design literacy is, 
here's why this design is a good design, and here's why this design isn't a good design. And we can start to walk through and break it down into its components of, of why it's, you know, you, you, you measure design on a scale of frustration to delight. So why is this one more frustrating and this one's more delightful? Right? The fact that, that this one is more frustrating and this one's more delightful is a huge awareness for some people, right? That they don't realize that you could have these two designs and one is more frustrating than the other. And they think the thing, you know, oftentimes because what makes something frustrating is you don't know how to use it, but when you've designed it yourself, you obviously know how to use it. So it's not frustrating to you, particularly if you just designed it but never used it. Mm. So it's definitely, there's been no frustration in that process. <laughs> so uh, that means that you are in this situation where as far as you're concerned, there's no frustration there, so it can't be a bad design, right? And they don't realize that, that when you put it in front of somebody else, they're gonna exhibit frustration. And then it's like, okay, how do I fix that? I don't know. So, so that's a lot of what those folks do, at least in the early days, is deal with that. And then after you've sort of gotten past literacy, you then have to work on fluency, right? And fluency is, is basically, can I predictably produce good design? You, know, you think about becoming fluent in a language, and that really means, can I actually string a bunch of words together in a sentence that m sounds like someone who normally speaks that language? Mm. And um, uh, the same is true in design. Can I consistently produce good design? That's fluency. And that just comes with practice and, and the ability to tell the difference between good and bad design. So I put something out, I tell, oops, that wasn't good, let me try it again. You know, oftentimes we start with recipes. Here's the formula for producing this. And then you, you do that, and that gets you to be able to do a small set of things very well. You know, it's like learning to cook. Mm. I can, you know, once I learn a recipe, I can make that thing over and over again. I can't make something slightly different from it, but I can make that thing over and over again as long as I have all the pieces. But then you become, when you become fluent, you can actually start to switch the pieces. You can start to say, oh, I can take that from over here. And that, that becomes mastery, right? Mm -hmm. so, the, so mastery is the last stage. So you go literacy, fluency, mastery. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, what teams are doing is they're working first on literacy and then on fluency. And once you get everybody to fluent, you're in that situation. When you think of a world in which businesses are design fluent and maybe design masters, right? Just generally in the business world. Um, when you have these infused teams and everyone's applying the tools of design, does design at that point become commoditized, you think? Uh, much like, say, a, like you don't need a telephone operator today, right? Um, and and you, you, don't, you don't need a, a, someone to, to type like word process for you because you just have access to the tools and the knowledge of how to do it yourself. Um, like what is what is the role of design in this in this new world? Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, uh, designers morph into something different than they are today, but yeah. that's okay. We yeah, sure. designers today are something way different than they were five years ago or ten years ago. Yeah. So uh, they are they are very different. I think I think. For designers to go away completely, we have to solve all of the world's problems. <laughs> so I'm assuming that's gonna be a while. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're probably not gonna be without designers f for that interval. Sure. Because as long as there are problems to solve, I, but the thing is is that designers are solving way bigger problems then than they are than they will be now, just like designers today. When I started in the design space, I was working with hot lead. So I was, I was working in newspapers and we were setting newspapers with, with these machines that would make lead in real time. Mm. And I didn't have to deal with the idea that I actually, if I needed an E and there were no E's in the type case, I'd have to go carve one. Mm. Uh, I could use the lead that was out of the machine and I could just plug it in and there was a, there was a way for me to create a new E in the type face that I needed uh, by just loading the right cartridge. And so uh, I, I didn't have to deal with the problem that designers before me had to deal with. Right, and nobody today has to deal with hot lead. 
right? Everybody today, they want an E, they type an E, and the, and the face magically appears. They don't go reaching into a type case. They don't go making type. They're, they're, um, they're creating... Uh, they're creating this in uh, in real time, and it's just happening. And so, so design is always changing. And anyone who sort of worries about design changing out for under them just hasn't had the right education. So the nature of problems change. The role of designers assimilate into whatever the new brave world is that we. Yeah, I mean, every time we solve a problem, we create a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, every time we uh, uh, learn about a problem, we realize that the problem is on multiple levels, and we can solve it on one level, but it will still exist on a bigger level. And so the the way we think about problem solving just changes, but but the 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 problems will be there. You know, people still need to communicate. People still miscommunicate. Those are huge problems, mm -hmm. right? How do we make it so that, you know, let's take a problem that happens every all the time, like every day now. Someone types something into Twitter asking what they think is a reasonable question. Someone else takes offense at that. They reply with something snarky. Now you've got this Twitter thing happening, right? How could we? How could we have prevented that? What could what what way could we prevent that? You know, what is the best way? Because if those same two people were sitting at the table across from each other, that conversation would not have happened that sure. way. So why is it that that people who get along misunderstand each other and then you know hell breaks loose on the Twitter, right? How do we how how would we solve that problem? And and that's not a problem of Twitter not working. That's a problem of people not communicating. Mm. And people haven't communicated for years. That's how wars have started, and it's still how wars have started. And now we have a president who's going to start a war over Twitter, and and all of that is is uh, bound to happen. Um, and all I can say is sad. Mm -hmm. But the, but the fact is, is that that's a problem. It's, and it's a solvable problem, though I have no clue how to solve it. So there seems to be a lot of, I don't know if it's confusion or uncertainty, just around hiring designers today, right? Um, and that may be for a number of reasons. Maybe it's just a skill set that wasn't taught to people. Um, maybe it could be the job descriptions that are just setting up the wrong expectations from day one. Um, but I'm curious how you think people and organizations should talk to designers um, and make sure that they hire the right ones for their, their business's needs. Yeah, so, so if you want to build a great design team, you have to hire great designers. I mean, there's no, there's no way around that. You can't, you can't build a great design team without that. So the, the problem is, is that the way we have uh, learned how to hire designers has been this really poor process I and mean, it's just by copying what we see other people do and slightly modifying it think we're somehow improving it it's this this evolutionary game of telephone and what we have today is this this mess of a hiring process in most organizations that has no clue how to hire how to even begin to hire people so we've been we've been doing a lot of work on helping teams learn a better hiring process. And the, the process that we've adopted is a process that is very thoughtful, very intentional. Uh, it's called performance-based hiring. It was invented by a, a dude named uh, Lou, Lou Adler. Um, and Lou's idea uh, is that you can, you focus on what you want the person to do very specifically. And it's really interesting. So in most organizations that we go into, they have a position called designer, and they create a single job description for designer. And then every designer they hire, they hire to that job description. If they, and, and 
or maybe they've, they've gone so far as to break it up and they'll have an information architect and a user researcher. And the user researcher will have one job description and the information architect will have a different job description and, and they'll, they'll just map to those job descriptions. And, and, but the job descriptions are, are vague and they're all based on must have three to five years of experience doing information architecture or whatever it is. And of course, someone who has, someone who has 10 years of experience could either have this intense 10-year experience where you can see their growth, or they could have spent 10 years at a job and done the exact same thing every year, so it's basically one year of experience repeated 10 times, and there's no growth. And what, what you want, what most hiring managers want, is they want someone who has grown because they're gonna need to come into this position and grow, and they're gonna need... So what you wanna do is you wanna look at comparable experience. And so what we do is we work with teams and we focus on, okay, if we're gonna hire these people, let's talk about what we want them to do. So the assignment that I give teams to start with is a process where the first thing you do before you write the job description, before you've written the job ad, before you do anything, is you write as a team, you write and agree on a thank you letter. And the thank you letter is a note in the future, usually one year after the person is hired, to that person, now we don't have a person yet, we don't know who they are, mm -hmm. but we're writing a note to that person thanking them for their first year and in detail spelling out all the amazing things they did over that year. Thank you so much for the incredible year you have changed our organization. The first thing you did was you came in and you sat down and you did an inventory of everything that uh, we've designed so far and you came up with the basics of our uh, design system. And then you worked with the development team to build out the design system and you got a pilot going with the onboarding team and they built their first tool with the design system. And you go through and you list out everything that that person did be, and you get everybody on agreement. And what happens is teams look at this and they go, really? I didn't think he was going to work on onboarding. Why would he work on onboarding for? And we yeah. have this conversation with the team. And suddenly we're talking about what will this person do when they get here? Yeah. And as soon as we have agreement on that, now we can ask the question, what do we need them to already know day one to be able to pull that off? Mm. And that's what we hire for. And then, if we're having someone come in and design a design system, do we want someone who's actually designed a design system before? Mm -hmm. Or do we want someone who's gonna learn how to de design a design system? Either answer is okay, but we need to answer that before the first interview happens, in fact, before we write the job ad. Because the job ad needs to say, we want you to come in and learn how to create a design system. Or, we want you to come in and create a design system that is better than all the ones you've created in the past, right? We want, we're gonna create the ad that way. And what you end up with is you end up with job ads that are very specific, so specific to what that position is about. Because I'm not gonna hire four designers that are gonna do design systems, I'm gonna hire one, right? And so they're very specific to that, that someone's gonna go, oh my gosh, that's like my dream job. And that everything I've done in my career has been leading up to this job, right? And they can talk to that. It's gonna change the way you interview because if you know you're hiring someone who has to be able to complete a design system in the first year, you're gonna look for the things that they've done in the past that do that. And what it does is it shifts the, the, the key to performance-based hiring is that it shifts the um, hiring process from what we call, uh, uh, what do we call it? My brain, my vocabulary server just crashed. <laughs> it shifts the hiring process from what we call gladiator voting, which is thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, mm -hmm. love them, kill them, right? <laughs> to an evidence-based thing that's like, oh, I have evidence that, he, that this candidate, she has created five design systems. Her first one wasn't very good and then she improved it this way and then she got it better the next time and then the fifth one was amazing and she's gonna come in here and she's excited about our challenges because we can talk to how ours are similar to what she's done before but not quite and she's really excited about that. So I can get her excited about the position and at the same time I can get excited about her work because I can see this path of her being able to handle the scale of our system because it's larger than anything she's ever done before. And that's really key. 
Because so often we'll, we'll get somebody and say, well, we need you to do a design system. You ever done one? Yep. Okay, cool. <laughs> Has done a design system. But we don't realize yeah. that they did one that had five elements in it, and we need one that's going to go across 7,000 apps and have 1,000 elements in it. And they have no idea how to handle that kind of scale. Yeah. Right? And it isn't until we have those conversations that we do it. And the thing is that you have all these conversations before the first interview. Yeah. Almost always in the teams that I go into who have not thought about their interview process, if they have these conversations at all, it's after they've interviewed the candidate and one person interviewed the candidate for someone who's going to create a design system and somebody else interviewed the candidate for a completely different position because they didn't know we were working on a design system. Mm -hmm. And and suddenly we realize we've got completely different people who have the same design title, but we're interviewing them completely differently. And one of them saying, I think they're perfect. The other one says, I don't think they're qualified at all. And, we, and we're now having a conversation with the clock ticking, waiting for this offer to go out. And this person is like, I'm going to get an offer from somebody. Sure. And, you know, that's a horrible time to do that. Yeah. Thanks again to Squarespace for supporting the show. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to get a domain, create a website, or build an online store. They make it simple to manage your online store and inventory, process orders, print packaging slips, and customize emails. Squarespace has powerful marketing tools. They ensure that search engines can find your store online, provide real-time analytics to help you gain customer insights, and let you connect with your customers on Facebook, Twitter, and more. If you've been thinking about starting your own online store, Visit squarespace.com and enter the offer code high resolution. That's one word to get 10% off your first purchase. Make your next move with Squarespace. We'd also like to thank our friends at Envision for their support. Envision is the world's leading product design platform, powering the future of digital design through their understanding of the importance of collaboration. They're used by some of the most innovative companies in the world, like Facebook, Capital One, Netflix, and Airbnb. I work with remote teams all the time, and I found that keeping a healthy dialogue is really important. Without it, building strong work relationships gets a lot harder, and that leads to poor collaboration. I've also found that prototypes are a great way for me to show my full vision for a design, and this helps cut down a lot of back and forth. Envision makes all of this really easy. You can rapidly prototype your designs and collaborate across every stage of your project, taking your ideas from concept to code. It simplifies virtually every aspect of the design workflow and makes collaboration a core part of the process for everyone, from project managers to designers, developers, and writers. Teams that build digital products are at a serious advantage when they use Envision's suite of prototyping and collaboration tools. It's the best way to get everyone on board. Visit envisionapp.com slash high resolution for three months free. Welcome back. <laughs> That was, that was awesome. That was that a good break? That was you have fantastic. A <laughs> um, here's what else I is fantastic. I feel so refreshed. Well, here, here's what else is fantastic <laughs> is you are one of three amazing guests that we're speaking to that are doing something pretty amazing. You are building... Just, I'm one of three. One of three, but uh, uh, you're mm. building your own design school. I am. And I want to talk about that. It's called Center Center. Mm -hmm. um, Two spellings. Two, two, two different, spell two different ways. Center, yes. Yeah. C-E-N-T-E-R-C-E-N-T-R-E. -E -E. That's right. Um, what did you see in the existing design school market um, where you saw a deficiency and said, this is something that you needed to do? Because this is no small feat, and you've, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. We've, five, five years. We've been working on this for project for five years. Right. Uh, yeah, so the, the way the project started at... Uh, my co-founder, uh, Leslie Jensen Inman, and I uh, started, started the project separately, uh, unbeknownst to each other. Uh, I was dealing with the fact that the companies, the companies that we were serving um, were struggling finding design talent. They, they were, we were spending a lot of time helping them bring people in uh, and helping them build their skills up from within. But uh, the talent just wasn't out there. There just were not enough designers. And design was, was five years ago starting to get real traction. Apple had sort of made the case for everybody that if you design things well, you will sell more at a higher price. And suddenly everybody wanted to be Apple. And, and, and all of a sudden, 
uh, design is now this bigger, brighter thing. So everybody, everybody needs, you know, get me some of them designers. And, and we're getting tons of calls and there were, there were just not enough. And, um, uh, so I was at dinner with, uh, one of the people who invented the web, uh, uh, there's really no other way to describe her, uh, Molly Holschlag. She, she was one of the world's first uh, serious web designers. She defined what people use on the web. And we we're having dinner in Chinatown in Boston. I remember it like it was yesterday. And, and I'm saying, you know, we got to get design, we got to get schools to produce more designers. And she said, well, you just should start a school. And I thought that was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard. And it, uh, uh, in the meantime, um, it, it wouldn't leave, right? That idea just wouldn't leave. And I started talking it around and sharing it with friends. And uh, they said, yeah, no, this is exactly right. You have to go do this. And my uh, co-founder at the same time, she was thinking about this from the education perspective. She had been teaching design at the University of Tennessee and she was getting her uh, doctorate in education and her dissertation was on how do we create a better design program that actually serves industry better and she was working on it from the perspective that schools were not producing people the way that uh, folks needed and so uh, a friend of mine said have you talked to Leslie I'd known Leslie for a long time but I didn't know what she'd been doing at, at University of Tennessee and uh, so I, I no, but I, I will, and then, and then didn't think much about it. And then a couple days later, Leslie tweets, uh, I've decided to resign from UTC to take on a new project. I don't know what my life is going to be like from this point on, but um, I'm, I'm ready for the new adventure. And so I, I sent back a I sent her a DM saying, hey, we need to talk. <laughs> and within hours, we were talking about this school idea. And she's like, yes, we need to do that's this. Great. And uh, so, so that's where it started. And then the first thing we did, because understanding the problem is the thing I do, is I wanted to understand, well, why aren't schools producing students? So the first thing we did is we went and talked to hiring managers. Mm -hmm. And we talked to hundreds of hiring managers. And what we ended up talking about was why, what do you look for in people? And this is how I found out that the hiring processes were all broken. But not only, you know, how do you hire people and what do you look for, but, you know, have you hired students and what, What's, what's gone on with that? How's that worked out? And what's worked well? And what's been disappointing? And what we found was uniformly hiring managers were disappointed with students to the point where uh, many of them had given up bringing in students at all. They, would, they want people with a certain amount of experience because they were tired of, of students who come in without having the skills necessary. And so, but the thing was, no one was feeding this information back to the schools. And so we, we said, well, there's an opportunity here. So we decided, yeah, let's create this school and let's, let's make the students industry ready. So that's, that's what we're doing is creating students who can, on day one, be useful parts of their team. And to do that, we had to take apart the way education is done. And because we operate outside the normal university structure, we don't have to be bound by a lot of the constraints that universities are bound by. There are all these constraints that have to do with accreditation and, mm -hmm. and structure that, that when we were designing our curriculum, we were able to say, let's put that aside for now. We'll come back to it if it turns out it adds value. But let's start with this idea of our goal is the end goal, which is how do we create someone who's industry ready? And for that, we came up with this two-year program that is 66% experience-based. It's 66% of the time students are working on projects. So in essence, you get a year and a half's worth of experience by just going to school. And you work on long projects. They are three to five months in length. They start with an assignment with 
what the project is and they end with deployment and post-deployment evaluation. So the students actually ship things, which is not done in most design schools. Mm -hmm. And they, um, uh, they go through all the processes. They go through all the elements. So it's not just, hey, I'm going to create a great design for this idea I had and I'm going to pass it in. You know, in today's design schools, uh, if you are an A student, your experience is often, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, I, I'm going to create this design, I'm going to hand it in, you're going to, to, as my teacher, you're going to give me an A, because I'm an A student, maybe you'll write in the margins one or two little things I could have done better, but because I was an A student, it's pretty much perfect, so you're just gonna hand it back to me. And that's, and I'm gonna do that over and over again inside classes, so if I take 25 classes, I'm gonna do that 25 times, get 25 A's, get 25 things back with virtually no comments on them. And I'm gonna think I'm a pretty awesome designer. And then I'm gonna go into the workplace, and I'm gonna hand something in that's a brilliant idea, and the developers are going to go say, "Yeah, there's no way we can implement yes. that. Goodbye." Yeah. And the the students are like, "But I, this is a work. Yeah. You don't understand. You are. You, how come you don't understand what a work is? I know this is a work. I've always gotten A's, right? And we don't want our students to graduate with that attitude. So our students actually have to build the stuff, and they have to give them to developers. And the developers are going to say, "I can't build that," and they're going to say. Okay, tell me what to do. And and they're going to learn, right? And they're going to learn how to be functional in an entire program that's built that way. So you spoke about getting your students industry ready, right? Um, what are the skills that you're committed to teaching them in this class, in this school? Uh, all of them. What are all? Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we are, uh, uh, we're focused both on sort of the technical skills, so they're going to learn how to uh, how to create design. So already, so we're five months in, and uh, I took uh, I taught the intro to UX course, and they they suffered through that for a few mm -hmm. moments, and then uh, which basically just sort of introduced what the two years of the program was going to be like, uh, and then uh, they started with sketching and prototyping. So they spent three weeks on sketching and prototyping, then they spent three weeks on information architecture, then they spent three weeks on uh, user research practices, and then three weeks on front-end development. And next one is critique and design studio, then they're gonna spend three weeks on copy and content strategy, then they're gonna spend three weeks on uh, scenarios and storytelling, and then three weeks on interaction design, and three weeks on visual design, and we're going to keep doing that 30 times. And so we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of, of sort of hard design skills, so interaction design, visual design, uh, copy and content, and uh, soft skills like critique and presenting and sketching. And the idea is that the students learn a mixture of how to work in a workplace. They'll learn, they're learning how to formulate emails. They're learning how to reflect on their work. They're learning how to work in teams and collaborate. Um, all the things that, that actually uh, a lot of schools don't teach, right? You know. Most schools, when they do group projects, they have three people work together on this short thing, and almost always one person does all the work, and the other two. So, so most of the the beginning of the of the short group project is two people trying to figure out who's going to be able to get out of the work most, and while the third person does everything for the team, and uh, that doesn't happen. Our, in our school, we have full-time faculty who actually are w paying close attention to the group projects and actually looking at the dynamic. And if someone's not doing the work, they're paying attention to that and they're saying, okay, for this next round, I want you to write the code and I want you to do the user research because it was the other way around last time. So that everybody gets the practice at doing everything. Mm -hmm. And the way we have, we have structured this is, is we've made it a, what we call a competency-based program. 
So instead of giving students a set of tests, instead of quizzing them on book knowledge, um, we have this set of competencies. Every course has somewhere between five and eight competencies. And a set of competencies, for instance, for the user research practices course, uh, some of the competencies were uh, observing a usability test, planning a usability test, moderating a usability test, recruiting participants for a usability test, synthesizing the results of the usability test. So they, they, they take, we take the, the skill set, we break it down into components, and then for each competency, there's a set of achievements. So for example, for um, planning the usability test, you had to figure out what the objective of the test was and how many sessions you were going to run and what type of participants you wanted to run. They recruit. don't have a textbook to, to help them here. They're kind of doing this as, like, as, as they go along in real time. In they're real doing life. this as they go along. So they're, they're, we've broken it down. The achievements get broken into four categories. Mm -hmm. We have developing things, which are basically you have to go out and read how it's done and then reflect that you understand the way to do this. So it's, it's, just, it's just you can describe what you learned by reading or by watching a video or something like that, but not having done it. Mm. Then we have what are called emerging achievements. And emerging achievements are, t take some toy application and, and do a little usability test on that. Here, let, you know, create some sketches and test the sketches, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And that's just to sh show that you've practiced it. And then uh, uh, we have proficient level. And proficient means, I've actually done this on a real project. So the students are always working on a project as a team that is a real project that they have to deploy. And so I go back and I now conduct usability tests on that project. Mm -hmm. And I may do it several times. And so that, that's the, the, the proficient level. And then we have distinguished level for students who may have come in already having studied user research somewhere, having done it before, where they know how to do all this stuff. Nobody tests out of a class. Instead, you go for distinguished. And in distinguished, you either teach somebody else. So you become a teaching assistant for that class and you help teach somebody else to do it because when you teach something, you learn something, sure. right? So every time you teach something, you learn new things about it. So teaching is good. So you can get distinguished that way. Or you do things during the course that show that you've gone beyond the course material in a way that we never taught you to do. So obviously, you must know how to do this better. So you do a, a type of study that is different than that. So um, the... Uh, those, those levels allow us to separate out good students from great students. They allow us to make sure that students are learning the things that a hiring manager be interested in. And when we design the competencies, we design them in mind where we can actually share them with the hiring managers. One of the things we learned as we were talking in our research for the school, one of the things we learned is that uh, for the most part, the reaction that hiring managers have from people who come right out of school is they're surprised at what they don't know. They're like, this person got an MBA in, in design or they got, an, they got a, a bachelor's in human computer interaction. How come they don't know how to do a basic usability test, right? They're just shocked at what they don't know. And what we realized after hearing this over and over again was that the schools are very bad at actually sharing what they teach. And so everybody imagines that they're learning all these important things, and then they find out that that's not what's taught in the school at all. And so we've decided to make explicit what they learned, right? So, so the competencies are something we share with the hiring manager. So they can see for every course we've taught what the students learned how to do. And in fact, the students can share what level of achievement, whether they got developing, emerging, proficient, what level of achievement they got while they were in that class. And they can actually talk to the project work that got them that level of achievement. And they can say, oh yeah, no, I conducted usability tests and I can walk you through my research plan and I can tell you how I did it. So that that, that ex, uh, experience-based hiring process 
is easy to do with our students because the students come prepared to share the stories. And so you can say, you basically have a menu that says, I need students who have done this, done this, done this, done this. That's the position I'm filling. And we can give you that. And then, and then the students will be able to tell you what they actually did to get there. So there, there are two things that your school does really well, it sounds like. First, you're teaching them timeless principles mm -hmm. that they can bring to any business for a right. long time. And then the second is you're teaching them how to learn, right? Yes. What tricks or tips, I, I don't want to use the word tricks, it's not a trick. What are some things that people listening or watching this um, can start doing today to, to generate a culture of self-learning? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that, if that makes sense, but that, that's... Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, well, so, uh, are you asking what what can they do to to learn themselves? Yeah, or, like or? what what are some tips you can give for them? Because I actually don't think it's obvious that learning how to learn is a is a quote learned skill, right? Right. Like, yeah, uh, well, that's just it, right? We 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 go through school thinking that uh, the school will know how we need to learn. Right. They will basically open our skull, pour information right. in, close it up, and send us on our way, right. and. Uh, that, that's not how it works. And it's stunning to me that we all come out of, of these programs having never thought reflectively about how we learn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have a lot of trick, they are tricks to some extent because they're basically about slowing down and looking at what did you do? So for example, um, one of the things that I work with teams to do is what I call journey critiques. And a journey critique is a critique of work, but it's not to decide whether the work is ready to go on to the next stage, whether the work ha has all the things in it that's going to make it a good design. It's to talk about, it's to critique uh, uh, how I got to here right? I was given this assignment. I understood it to be these things. I then went down this journey and now I've produced this, this end result. Let me tell you about how I got there. Let me tell, show you all the work I did. Let me show you the sketches, the, the stuff that didn't quite work the way I wanted. Let's, let's walk through that process. And how did I make decisions? And what principles emerged from the decisions I was making so that I could in, in the future I could say, yeah, when I run into this problem again, this is how I'm going to deal with that thing. And so it's, it's this process of sharing that. And what I've seen that when teams do that, mm -hmm. the act of just putting that presentation together causes you to realize and look back and say, wow, I learned a ton in this Thing. And here I can actually list out all the things that I didn't know how to do when I started the project that I now know how to do. And just, just that act of making explicit what I've learned focuses you on the fact that, well, sometimes I'm learning more than others. Sure. And we've gotten to the point where we build into, uh, so, you know, at Center Center we have uh, what a lot of teams have, we have a daily stand-up or scrum, right? This meeting where we all get together and we talk about, and it has the normal things in it, you know. What did we do since the last time we did this? What am I planning to do before the next time we do this? What are the big obstacles that are in my way? What's the thing that I'm working on that's highest priority, right? These are common questions. But we've added a, what we call the fifth question, and it's got a name, we call it number five. <laughs> and... Uh, the fifth question is, uh, what's the most important thing I learned since the last time we met, and how will it change what I'm doing in the future? Now, don't tell anyone, but that's really two questions. But it turns out that by talking about that, and every day having to report on something important that I learned in the last 24 hours, and how it's going to change what I do going forward, that focuses me to start thinking about what did I actually learn? And we've gotten to the point where people who don't participate in the stand-up, we actually now have a Slack channel called Daily Learning where everybody in the company is responsible for putting this there. And in the school, each of our students do exactly the same thing. They have a stand-up that they report their daily learning in and then they put it in the Slack channel because it turns out that by keeping a log of this stuff, when you're reporting your daily learning, you're, you're often focused on what you're about to say and not listening always to what others say. But when you have them in this channel, you can go back and read them and go, oh, 
That's, that's right. Awesome. Yeah. It and forces self for reflection. Exactly. And taking those moments for reflection are really critical. And we we don't we don't give our time to selves time to do this. And when you when you have a question like that in stand up, suddenly you you create this culture where learning something every day is one of the most important things we can do. Okay. That suddenly means uh, that we've decided that learning here is important. And personally, I would love to see a shift away from this stupid idea of you know we need to fail, mm. right? I don't care whether we fail. I only care whether we learned. I know lots of people who have found ways to learn without the shame of failing. And yeah, sometimes when you make mistakes, you learn from them, and that's awesome, and you can be honest about that. But you don't have to have made a mistake to learn something. Oh, and by the way, I know a lot of people who make a lot of mistakes and never seem yeah. to learn from them, yeah. right? So so let's focus on the learning, not on the failing. Yeah. Let's learn better. Right. So sure. it sounds like where someone should start is just having that self-awareness to actually ask themselves that question and then reflect exactly. on those learnings. So uh, we need to jump into the community questions next. This could be a super rapid fire. Okay. Um, we're asking every guest this. Our community reached out to us and said, these are the things that are burning up in their mind. In their mind. In their mind. It's, oh my God, it's the mind the, fire. Yeah. <laughs> Actually not. <laughs> mind burning. So, so the, the first question is, um, how do you explain, so for someone in a business, how do they explain? I use words. <laughs> How do you explain the role of design to people in a business? Design is the rendering of intent. So uh, the role of design is to ask the question, what are we intending? And did we get that? So that's in its simplest form that's what it is uh, you know what are people's roles when they're designers their designers are to a figure out what the intention is and b render that intention and then figure out if they actually got there and you can break that into lots of different parts of the problem mm -hmm. but that's in essence what it is so uh in an organization it's 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 being able to do this and you know, we talked earlier about this idea that, that at some point designers go away. And designers go away when everyone is able to do that. At which point, you know, a designer is not necessary because everyone is designing. Everyone's a designer. The second question is around team organization. Um, have you noticed any patterns in how design teams are actually structured in design mature companies? Yes, they're all made of people. Um, sort of like soil and green. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I think design design fills a void, right? And so in different organizations, the void is different. Mm -hmm. In some places, they have the technology down, but they don't ever think about who their users are. So design's role is mostly about bringing the users and their needs into the organization. In other organizations, they actually are very, they're very confident and they understand who their users are and what they're trying to do, but they don't actually know how the technology works. So there, the design is about getting the technology to do what it needs to do. And I, 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 this, this question keeps coming up, and there isn't one thing that design does, which is why this idea of hiring a designer, because they were a designer someplace else, they can be a designer for us. Well, if we have different voids than they had that person did very different things and may not be able to help us with our void in fact if they come in thinking that we are just like the place they used to be they are probably not going to work at all and so uh we have to get to a level of specificity that is way more detailed because it, it, it fills a void, right? If we're talking about rendering intent, is it that the intent is wrong? Is it that the rendering is broken, right? Which one is it? it you're going to need people with different skills depending on what that is. And so designers basically fill voids. And that's, that's um, that doesn't sound sexy, though I guess on some level that is what sex is. But we don't have to go there. The, the, uh, um, the, the, 
it's okay. This is this is rated R at some level. You put whatever you put whatever label on this you want. Um, uh, the uh, the key thing is that that design is really about helping the organization understand what its intentions are and how to render it. And and you you fill in where you need the help, and you don't fill in where the where the organization seems quite competent. Uh, should designers measure and present results to people in the business in any specific way? Like, is this uh, if you're if you're a designer and you're presenting to non-designers your body of work, not in an interview setting, but in your business day to day design activities? There are there any specific tactics or? Ways to present your ideas to people that aren't designers. absolutely right. I mean, talk about them. Uh, uh, you, de- you the first thing you have to do is figure out what way can people receive the work. Right. Right. So again, this goes back to the literacy, fluency, mastery. If they don't understand the difference between good and bad design, your your presentation has to be all about good and bad design. Right. You have to talk about how what you either have now or had in the past is not good design. Yeah. You have to talk about what are the failures of the design of your competition. Yeah. You have to talk about what makes your competition good. You have to talk about what your existing stuff does well so that you don't break it. And then you have to talk about how this thing that you're building is going to improve upon that. Mm-hmm. And you may have to break it down and put it into terms that have nothing to do with the actual design itself. So you may have to speak a completely different language. I, I often am, am helping folks talk to executives. and. One of the things that I learned a long time ago is that, in essence, all executives are worried about five things. There's only five things that executives really care about, right? Increasing revenues, decreasing costs, increasing the number of new customers who are using this thing, getting more money from the existing customer base, and that's often retention or, or just additional services. And uh, this amorphous thing known as shareholder value, which uh, is only amorphous because we don't know really how to speak about it, but it's actually quite simple. It's it's the long term sustainability of the business. You know, if 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 there's a housing crisis, how do we get through that? If there's a, you know an economic downfall, or if there's a war, you know how how are we going to survive when our competitors can't? You know, if there's a new technology, how will we adapt? So so. Um, uh, those those five things. That's what executives are pro- focus on. That's what they're trained to focus on in school. That's what makes them really good at what they do. Over hundreds of years of running institutions, they they've boiled it down to those five things. So that means you, if you're going to talk about design, you have to talk about design in terms of those things. How is our design going to increase revenues? How is it going to decrease costs? Maybe it's going to reduce support costs. Maybe it's going to stop developers from. Uh, building features that that nobody ends up using, which is waste, right? How is it going to attract new customers? How is it going to get more money out of existing customers? How is it going to help us survive in the long term? Are we creating technical debt? Are we latched into a technology that if it becomes obsolete or illegal, mm. uh, uh, suddenly we can't use it anymore? Mm. You know, uh, um, uh, so those that's what design is. And so being able to talk in those terms gets you way more progress with executives than saying, this is great design, you just have to trust me. And we can end here. Um, as the oh. role of design... But we're having so much fun. <laughs> we, we, we really are. And like, I mean, I, I wish we could spend like hours more talking, but... Me too. I'm yeah. hungry. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I'm hungry. sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so as the, as the role of design continues to evolve, um, what are some... Oh, sorry, as the purpose of design continues to evolve, what are some roles and methods that you think might emerge over the next five years? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I, I think that uh, we're going to see much more emphasis on end-to-end experience, right? So this idea that experience isn't just 
the application or the dialogue box that I'm dealing with, but is this bigger thing and we have to think about the bigger thing and, and we have to think about what it's like when a customer first meets us and what it's like all the way through their lifetime with us and how do we extend that lifetime and how do we get more revenue from them over that lifetime and, and all the things. And I think that, that, and how do we get them to tell other people to come talk to us? All those things are sort of, but that's not new. That's been going on for a long time. I, I'm not a futurist. People ask me all the time, so what's UX going to be like in five years? I'm like, well, there are going to be people. I can guarantee that part. There's probably going to be some amount of technology. I can guarantee that. Beyond that, I'm not going to define anything. Uh, I'm a historian. I ask the question, people came out with a product. What was their intention? Did it meet that intention? You know, Why was the BlackBerry a popular thing? Why doesn't anybody have a BlackBerry anymore? And why did the iPhone do better than the BlackBerry? Those are the questions I'm most interested in because that's, I think, where the real meat of the problems are. I don't think we've spent enough time trying to uh, understand what has happened in the past I think we spend so much time looking forward and not looking back that we leave this wealth of information on the table that could be so helpful to us. Because if we can understand why successful products became successful and why failed products inevitably failed, we, we can suddenly get to this point where we can say, wow, let's not do what they did, let's do what these guys did. And so um, I think that we need... Uh, we need to be less forward-looking. So I actually don't care what the next three to five years have. I want to understand how the last 30 years tells a story that we can learn something from that will make the next three to five years better. And that's where I'm focused. So I, I, I'm clueless. I, I, I think we will all have uh, 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 processors embedded under our skin and... Uh, uh, is this the alternate answer? <laughs> airports, <laughs> airports will finally be a delightful experience. <laughs> that, that'd be incredible. That's a good place to end, <laughs> yeah. Jared. Thank you. This Thank has you been so fantastic. Much. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for for showing up in my office with <laughs> by surprise and just <laughs> taking we over my it. day. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hey, you made it to the end. Congratulations. Thanks for watching the episode. I really, really hope you liked it. If you did like it, please leave us a review on the iTunes store. And by the way, if you have any questions that came up because of the content that, that we covered with our guests, go on YouTube, go on Twitter. You can tweet us, you can leave us a comment. We'll get back to you. We'll help you as much as possible. At High Res Podcast. That's the, the screen name or the handle for Twitter, for Instagram, for Facebook. Find us, talk to us. We want to converse with you. Uh, we're not going to leave here, by the way, without also thanking our friends at Searle Video. They've been an amazing partner on this entire project. So Searle Video is a creative studio based out of Portland, Oregon. They've helped creative communities tell stories for over 10 years. They've done advertisements, behind the scene footage, uh, and documentaries for companies like Google, Slack, XOXO Festival, Adobe, Intel. They're incredible. They've traveled with us through the entire country documenting these stories with our guests. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Searle. Listen, if you're a startup looking to elevate your product, if you're a big company looking to humanize your brand, if you're someone in the creative community who just wants to tell a story, you've got to check out the team at Searle Video. It's searlevideo.com, S-E-A-R-L-E, video.com. Check out our friends at Searle. Thank you so much, guys. You guys have been incredible on this project.